It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 15, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Amigo Bob Contesano. Amigo is one of the most widely experienced and influential figures in California organic agriculture, and therefore kind of one of the most widely experienced and influential figures in organic agriculture in the United States. He was the founder of the Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. He founded the Ecological Farming Conference. He started the first organic farm farm advisory business in the United States, as well as starting multiple organic farming operations around California. Amigo's been around. If you've never been on his bus tour of Central Coast Organic Farms as part of the Eco Farm Conference, you're really missing out on something that just shouldn't be missed out on. In this episode, we talk about the basics of organization and planning as they relate to organic farms, the connection between paying attention and getting top yields, and Amigo's recent work with another organization he founded, the Felix Gillet Institute. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Osborne Seed Company, founded by seed professionals and dedicated to serving professional growers of all scales. Osborne Seed provides quality seeds, excellent customer service, and fantastic selection. OsborneSeed.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Fertrell, a friend of nature since 1946. No matter your level of experience, Fertrell has the products and knowledge to help you grow healthy, natural plants and animals. Fertrell.com. Amigo, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Well, thank you, Chris. It's an honor. You know, um, and it's it's actually, I think, the honor's mine you, to have you on this on this call because you're. I don't know if you know this, but you're really one of the reasons why I got into farming as as hard and heavy as I did, and and part of why I ended up getting so much into the outreach side of things is that I was so inspired by the work that you were doing at Eco Farm and the conversation that we had when you came to visit Deep Springs College back in 1991. And when I saw what, what you were doing, I said, you know, I kind of want to be like that when I grow up. Oh, and, uh, well, I'm still, I'm still growing up, Chris. So, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, you know, I, I, well, thank you. That's an honor to hear that. And it's also an honor to know that you've done a lot with your life. And I could tell when I first met you that you were already inspired, you know, and that you're, and Deep Springs was, that was a great experience that short time we were there. I really stuck with me. I have told stories about that place it, uh, to others. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't done anything more in my life, but just try to address what to me looks like needs to be done. I, I never think of these things as all oh, they're unique or special. It's just, Oh, well, we got to do this, you know, and somebody, if I don't step up to it. Somebody else will, or maybe it won't happen. And, that's kind of mostly my projects have been that way. I don't really dream them up and think I'm going to change the world. I just start doing stuff and then you see what comes out of it. Some of it turns out to be pretty special. I think I read as I was, as I was getting ready for the, for the interview today and, and uh, Google stalking you all over the place that the part of the reason that you got into farming was that was for that kind of very practical approach that you saw that there was something that needed to needed to be done. And and decided that this is where you were going to focus your efforts. Yeah, it's kind of a mixture. You know, my great aunt and uncle were farmers. So growing up, I was interested in that. I went to I was a city kid, but you know, my family had a history in agriculture in California. I'm part of the original Spanish that came here in the 1770s, and um, and we were ranchers. And then various parts of the family got into different things. And in my life growing up, my great aunt and uncle were farming fruit. And, uh, grapes and walnuts, and that that was part of the inspiration. My grandma was a great gardener, and she taught me gardening. And you know, I, I, the, the term organic wasn't in the lexicon yet, but she was an organic gardener and made compost and raised chickens and grew fava beans. And you know, so there's you know, I, one of my first recollections of my grandma was. And we were picking cucumbers, you know, these spiny little things to make big and cute. And, uh, you know, so that kind of stuck with me. And then I, uh, the environmental movement, I, I went to the first Earth Day in 1970. Well, even before that, I was working in, a, I worked in one of the first, what uh, became known as natural food stores, 1968 in San Francisco, right in the middle of all the malls from the 60s and got inspired by food and met some farmers that came in to sell stuff to the store. and. That, that was inspirational, and then it got involved with food food buying clubs and cooperatives and storefronts and 
and that sort of helped start a store. But you know, you know, we needed to have better access to higher quality food at a price we could afford. And and uh, I, my roommates was living in a commune at that time. A couple of my roommates' brothers were uh, growing up farming. I didn't grow up farming, but they'd grown up farming, and they left it. And, and then they had a chance to go back to being farmers, um, although they really wanted to be beekeepers, and their grandpa had a piece of land. And I thought, boy, beekeeping sounds like a really interesting and challenging adventure, and I'd never been around bees, so I went down and volunteered with them a couple of days, and I got hooked. And the property there had six acres of ground that wasn't being used while well, it had been planted the young walnut trees, but there's a lot of room in between the trees. And our co-op was interested in getting more fresh vegetables, and one thing led to another, I said, all right, let's team up with my buddies, and by then... A girlfriend that became my wife, and I joined up with my two friends that were brothers, and they're all doing this together. And then the bees got really busy, as they do, and kind of outgrew the four of us. So they kind of focused on the, the bees, and uh, we ended up focusing on the vegetables and fruits, literally not really knowing what we were doing. Before that, I'd just done gardening, and, and in communes, I maybe had an acre, or acre and a half, we did to feed ourselves, but power into like actually growing stuff to sell. And that was a period of time when people were really interested in you know, kind of a, a resurgence in the interest of, of good food. It's the back of the land movement era and there were people moving back on the properties and starting to grow things. And you know, it just seemed like the right thing to do to supply our food co-op and other buying clubs. And then we started a little trucking company and one thing led to another, but yeah, I, I just saw that the need, uh, there just really wasn't anybody, well, there wasn't anybody supplying our co-op other than some farmers from far away, and we just thought, well, it might be good to, have to grow something locally, and then that just sort of set the stage, and then I went from there, to be honest. How did you go from, from farming, from having the six acres in between the walnut trees, to starting to reach out and work with other growers? Oh, that was a transition. I was farming at that point in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, I was, we were getting polluted and poisoned by the neighboring farmers. I, I remember distinctly getting sprayed with a fungicide one July morning after the a rain came in unexpectedly on the peach orchard next door and the crop dust or, you know, dusted our house. I mean, literally with fungicide, not dust spray, actually. And I, and I just wasn't, uh, we, you know, I come from an environmental background here. I'm farming in the valley that's just totally toxed out. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And I'm like, well, that's not going to work. And I'm trying to raise kids. And, you know, it's just was a poison spot. And this time when people were not very conscious. And we were the, there was two organic farmers, another friend of mine that was growing berries in our county, in the big county, and everybody else was conventional at I just said, that's, I don't want to get out. I want to get out of this. So we went to look for an opportunity in a place that was much less uh, fertile and much less productive, but a lot cleaner and got moved back up into the Sierras where I had been living previously, but at a lower elevation where it was possible to do some farming. So at any rate, so moving up into the Sierra, uh, the soil is much less fertile. I started to do soil tests, trying to figure out why things wouldn't grow as well as they had it the valley, and I knew the climate was different, but the soil was a lot different. So starting to soil test and realize there's some substantial nutrient deficiencies, particularly phosphorus, the Sierras are really low naturally in phosphorus, and in the valleys, it's rich in phosphorus, and that's a big big elemental issue. Nitrogen is also deficient, but phosphorus is a big deal. So anyway, I ended up searching around looking for uh, some rock phosphate, couldn't find anything locally, and then ended up going to a farm supply and Marin County that was kind of an organic farm supply, but the guy wasn't very reliable. In fact, one time I drove up all the way for a five-hour drive, the guy's closed for the day to go hiking on a mountain somewhere. You know, it's like, whoa. So that kind of led me to, well, you know, I'm going to address this again. It's sort of that I do things out of need, not necessarily out of planning. And I said, well, oh, we got to find some pots. I started looking around and realized the only place I could buy it was out of Florida. In order to buy it one bag, I had to buy 1,600 bags. So I went with my neighbors and hooked up with them and bought some bags together. We bought a rail car in. And that adventure, we had more phosphate than we had uh, 
we had people wanting it. So I just took the rest of it and stuck it in the barn on the farm there. And that ended up birthing a farm supply business, which still is in business. I have nothing to do with it any longer, but I, I ran that Peaceful Valley Farm Supply for a long time, started it and ran it there at Peaceful Valley Farm and then grew it up and then sold it in 89. And, and in that process of doing a farm supply, it started really just for my neighbors. Uh, it turned out there wasn't anybody else doing this, that we were the only kind of reliable business and uh, that was doing organics in anywhere in Northern California. And then I came to find out that it was anywhere on the California. There just wasn't even anybody doing it. And then I found out people, so people started coming in and calling in and showing up from all over the place, asking me questions that I really didn't have experience with. And, and especially with farmers who needed much more detailed information than uh, just, you know, casual. And I really didn't like the role of being uh, trying to sell somebody something when I didn't even really know what it is they really were up to. So I started taking a day here and there while I ran that business from 76 to 89. And I just started going visiting farms and going around and, and hanging out and learning more and also seeing if I could be more helpful. And uh, as that became, as I did that longer and longer, it became apparent to me that um, that that there was a need for more technical advising than there was for product sales. Although you certainly sometimes needed products, but a lot of times this is uh, technological uh, information they needed, which didn't didn't necessarily, uh, oftentimes, didn't require any inputs or maybe maybe required less inputs than they thought. And a lot of people are meeting or new to organic farming and they weren't very knowledgeable. And I wasn't, I was that much knowledgeable, but I learned how to read soil tests and learned about the beneficial aspects and worked on it with biological control of my farming friends and with university people. And, and I, I learned a fair amount then. Um, but it also, the other piece of that is, and I, I saw there in the late, 70s that there was a dearth of opportunities for farmers to get together and share, break bread and share their knowledge and, and their fun experience. So I started the ecological, what's known as ecological farming conference there in 81, which now people call Eco Farm. And, and that was, you know, let's get our friends together uh, at this farm supply on a mailing list. So I thought, well, you know, and I got some friends down in the valley and they said, yeah, we could rent a building and so one thing went another, we started off with 45 people, and it turned out it was the first event of its type where, you know, people got together and, and commented and talked about organic farming, the first event of its type in this part of the world anyway. And that just took off like a rocket, a lot more people the next year, and it just grew and grew and grew. And so I could see that there was a lot of interest. Uh, and then there was the, ALAR, what was known as ALAR Sunday, when... Uh, well, the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, got, uh, oh, I just forgot her name, the famous actress. Um, they got they got her interested. So the ALR was this uh, carcinogenic growth regulator used on apples. And uh, they were, NRDC was trying to try to campaign to, to ban that or get it off the apples. And uh, Meryl Street, that's her name. Meryl Street took it up as she was a mom and, uh, she was concerned about apple juice and wasn't necessarily the organic issue, but the uh, mom was interested. Mother's, I think it was uh, moms. Anyway, I forgot what the acronym was, but moms was a group that she helped start. And, um, and they were, you know, interested in getting this poison out of their food. Well, that, then there, then she appeared on, uh, on 60 minutes on a Sunday and that, the whole thing changed that week. All of a sudden, organic became very popular. It made the front page of the uh, Time magazine. And I remember we were laughing one day. It was so much demand overnight. My friends we were selling potatoes for five five dollars a fifty pound box, and within two weeks after that, it jumped up to forty, and then fifty bucks a box. Wow. But which all of a sudden, of course, there was no, there was a big demand. Supermarkets all of a sudden wanted organic. It's interesting that kind of that whole spark there that came out of the Taylor thing, but there wasn't a supply. And so then all of a sudden there was a need for or get more organic farmers uh, and not, there weren't, there wasn't no technical resources. And I didn't know I was starting the first organic farms 
uh, farm advising business. I had no idea. Uh, but I was seeing that farmers, especially conventional farmers, they wanted to convert to organic or organic people wanted to expand. So I started, you know, providing that advice and that actually coincided with me getting fed up with running the farm supply. It got so darn busy. So I sold that to a couple of my employees and started off organic ag advisors there in the spring of 89. And it was like, oh my goodness, an instant success. I was actually too successful. I didn't, I kind of worked myself to the bone trying to satiate this brand new interest, which was predominantly conventional growers who wanted to go organic so they can meet this new market that they didn't even really know about before. And most of them didn't have a clue about how to farm organically, and they didn't know even what the rules were. And I'd actually been around since we wrote the first rules, well, right, the first rules in 79, and you know, I was the first in the country, and I'd been around working on it ever since with CCOF and then Omri. And so, you know, I had a pretty good understanding of what the rules were, what the materials you could use, and the technological things that you needed to do to get this going. And, then I began to realize that actually a lot of this was just a psychological thing that most farmers had started using chemicals that they hadn't been taught other ways, a more natural approach, which has been done for thousands of years. So I just, uh, at one point I had a business card that said farm psychologist. <laughs> I thought that's what I, thought. <laughs> I I mean, I just was like, it was like changing people's psychology, literally. And, uh, you know, so, you know, one thing leads to another, and I'm all of a sudden a farm advisor. I didn't necessarily jump into that gig intentionally, but I kind of filled the void, and, and it turned out it was a pretty big void. And uh, and then I ended up kind of in my niche for a long time. You <laughs> could say a high percentage of the people I've worked with are conventional farmers who want to become organic farmers, and they need somebody to get their training wheels on as a minimum. Some of them I worked with for 20 years, but... I ended up being the guy, for better or worse, helped start a lot of these now are large-scale organic farms. And some of them embarrassed me, but but I was I, I'm of the belief that if the farm, all the farm community doesn't start going this way, I'm, we're just a spit in the ocean. So, oh, I and I I oh, I do I, sa- I sacrifice my uh, ideals uh, to work with people who uh, I felt were going to at least move this thing forward. So. That's a long-winded way of saying I didn't necessarily make a plan to go to be from a farm or to be a farming advisor. It just, again, I, I think I just see, for whatever reason, the need and then try to figure out how I can fill it. So when you were, when you were working with the conventional farmers who were looking to transition to organic, and I, and I assume these are, you know, you've got a conventional carrot farmer and they're looking at how to become an organic carrot farmer. They're not, it's not like, it's not like you're, you're teaching people a whole new business, but you're really just teaching them a whole new way of producing. What, what kinds of, what kinds of challenges were and are farmers facing in making that transition? Well, the first challenge is the lack of information. I mean, it's just, there's, you know, if you went to the, you know, I, I just use an example. I hadn't, hadn't grown walnuts before. And in 76, I was growing walnuts, no, 75. And I went to the farm advisor to learn about walnuts. I'd leased a piece of ground out about four or five acres of walnuts on it. And I went to the farm advisor to say, you know, I told him, I walked in the door saying, I'm an organic farmer. I want to learn how to grow walnuts organically. And in an hour's time, I remember going back and telling my sweetheart, well, I don't think we can grow these organically. I think we're going to have to spray them. So he had brainwashed me. Here's a guy that walked in the door already already doing organic farming, just didn't know that crop. So that guy had, had successfully, I remember him, Larry Fitz, the University of California Cooperative Extension, Utah Sutter County Farm Advisor, had brainwashed me into believing there was no way to do it. So, and then a miracle happened, and I found some people who knew that, and because I turned out to be <laughs> university wanted to, shoot some pictures of beneficial insects and couldn't find any in conventional farms. They end up on this hippie farm because they needed to set up a <laughs> car pictures. And that's not an exaggeration. They were writing the first pair pest management, IPM manual, uh, for how to reduce pesticides in, in pairs. When integrated pest management was first, that term was first coined, 
they couldn't find the beneficial insects they wanted to show in pear orchards because they had been obliterated. So our the, the cover of that man, of that uh, manual is a picture of a lacewing eating a, a caterpillar. I mean, a lacewing larva eating a caterpillar. That was taken on a squash leaf on my farm, but they, you know, hybridized that into a pear. What I mean by that is that I happened to meet some people who were interested because this was the farm that wasn't spraying, so then the biological control people were interested in this. But as I went looking around, there wasn't anybody else that was giving good information or how to do this without chemicals. So most of what it starts off with most farmers is they don't have a good knowledge base. So right there, that's what I do first is try to first help them understand that people were farming without chemicals for a long time. And yeah, you have to, you have to get creative, but that you can do these things. So yeah, I work with, I got the first large scale carrot operation going by teaching them, okay, you need crop rotation. So you're not buying fertilizers as much and to smother the weeds. You need to increase the organic matter so the water holding capacity is better. You don't need as much nitrogen because you're going to grow legumes. And then legumes, are like, what the heck is that? I mean, that's as basic as, you know, nitrogen fixation. These things, people don't know that. The great three million sure people still do, but a lot of these farms didn't have those basics. And, oh, by the way, there are things that eat the row beetle and they eat the aphid. And so, so let's get those into the field by attracting them or providing the habitat. So a lot of what I do is really basic. Uh, I mean, I also know how to do the more trick stuff, but if you don't get the basic stuff first, there's no point in doing the trick stuff. So what I really try to do is re-educate them and, and re- have them realize that they actually have more power than they think. Most most farmers, I think, have been duped into believing that they are, they're not in control of their own destiny, that they have to give it up to somebody else who creates some magic potion in a box or a laboratory. I don't know it works at all. So what I just try to do is get them excited about the possibilities. Most of these people got into it for the money. The most heartening part to me is when they get it and they realize the money is secondary, that actually is a better way to farm. And they learn stuff and they realize a lot. And mom said, I mean, this is harder than I used to do with chemicals. But I like it because it makes me think more, and I got to plan more, and I can't just react with a spray. And so, you know, so yeah, so I, I think most of this is knowledge is missing. You know, it's not products. Sure, you need some products. There's things that you have to use if, to make high quality these days, for sure. But these are things that are, you know are are secondary to the to the system and uh, to a systems approach. And it, that's really what I try to help people with. Just think this through. What's a crop rotation look like? What are your main issues? Of course, almost every organic farm, the main one is weeds, you know, or was that common one. And so, like, how do we manage these weeds? And I need to start from there. And then I also, the other really cool thing about working with conventional farmers, that most of them are the survivors from the rest of agriculture that's gone. So to be a survivor, you got to be a good farmer. So they're good with chemicals. All, what I just do is say, look, you can be a good farmer and not use chemicals. Here's how you do it. And oftentimes they just, they, they, that was all it took. And then they have to, of course, do it for a while to be able to believe it themselves. And then they're off and running. So it's, it's mostly just breaking down the myths and stereotypes and that you don't have to go to the farm supply to survive. That there are actually a lot of stuff you can do on your own. And when you go to the farm supply, you get to be selective instead of just buying any old thing they want to push down your throat. And that's really what I do is just give them the basics. You know, here's what you need to do. And now, now more farm supplies to offer these things. Back then, it was hard to find them. But, but really, it's just a matter of empowering them for them to realize that you know, it's actually in their hands. And that they just have given that power up to other people, thinking that they're they're out of control. And nobody's fully in control, but farmers have a great opportunity to to mitigate those issues and to maximize the benefits. But they oftentimes don't think that way until they get an opportunity to start doing it without the chemicals. Well, and I think that it's if if you're in that reactive mode, you've automatically uh, you've moved beyond the opportunity to mitigate. You know, if you're if you're in a if you're in a symptom spray modality, then you're not, you're not in a, 
you don't have any options. You've really, you really have backed yourself into a corner. You're trapped. You know, whereas yeah. if you're in a, if you, if you, if you really do think about the organic system, and I think this is why it's so important, you know, this whole idea that we have of the organic farm plan is such an important concept because it really does force you to think through everything. How am I going to respond to this? What can I do to prevent it from happening in the first place? Yes. Yeah, I think a lot of this is uh, in, in successful organic farming is you're thinking a lot farther out. You know, that, how do you do that crop rotation so your weeds and your fertility, you know, are in good shape? You know, chemicals farming, you don't have to make as much planning because you can react. And, you know, you can always, almost always have a hammer that's pretty darn big if you get a problem. You don't have those hammers to a great degree in organic farming. So you, you have to get creative. And, and I think that's why people, a lot of them like it. A lot of conventional guys like it and women as well, is that they, they are able to get more creative and think this thing through in a different way. But, yeah, if you're just, you know, you want to go down the road system of, yeah, I'm going to plant X number of acres at this many seeds per acre and then going to use this much fertilizer and spray that, well, that's kind of a road system. You don't have to think too much. These things require much more, a good system requires a lot more planning. And I, I think that's great. I, I like working on that part more than the reaction. I've oftentimes get called on farms to put out fires. And that, that's just from poor planning. You know, we can avoid most of those fires. We just think these things through and also learn that nature's pretty resilient. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people, they freak them when the first time they see a little bit of a problem and they're going organic and, and they realize, oh, well, that system's still stabilizing. And, you know, you've been spraying something for decades out there. The system's out of whack. And and it takes a while. That's true with anybody. Animals or humans, same thing. You know, if you've been using yourself for a while, it takes a while to rebalance. So, you know, that's, I, I think this, that's why I, I think organic farming is wonderful. I think it's got its own set of limitations, but it, it does give farmers the opportunity take full charge of their farm. I like that. Taking full charge of your farm. It really is. And it's full charge and I think full responsibility for it as yeah. well. I mean, you really are, yeah. you know, you're really saying I'm the, I'm the one who's making the decisions here. I'm in control. Yeah. Um, I mean, oftentimes, I, at least, you know, I don't know, I was in your neighborhood, but you know, a lot of farmers get their advice from the guy selling them something. And you know, that's the vested interest right off the bat. That's, and then the university system is pretty much, at least in my neighborhood, it's, it's hook, line, and sinker part of the chemical industry. So what do you learn when you go to the field days? How do you use chemicals? So, you know, it's really hard. I think back 20 years ago, we are doing better than we are now with the universities in many ways. But but the, but the bottom line of this is that most farmers are just, you know, they're, you know, I, I've seen it. You know, there's a guy out dust control advisor working for a chemical company and convincing the grower they've got a problem and oh well and here's the solution I happen to offer it for you and by the way don't tell them that of course but you're making a profit doing that so those independent people get out there and talk and don't get paid by selling product which I never have and I never will it you know it allows you to be objective and as soon as you get objective out there then farmers realize oh okay I might suggest a product that might be useful, but it's not my income dependent upon it. They can pick whatever material they want to use, but most farmers are are are, are sold a bill of goods. And, and you know, ah, these guys show up and now they give you a pen or a ball cap or whatever, you know, or a baseball. I got one of those sitting over here signed by somebody. You know, it's just like, okay, well. You know, this is, this is all ways to buy people's mentality. And, you know, and if you read those tag mags and they're all about, you know, you know, doom and horror, very little about good news. So, you know, you get people in this mindset where they feel like they're up against the wall all the time. So you, you go to the doctor, you know, and the doctor happens to be invested in interest. And I, I think that's why we're in such a fix we're in right now to a great degree with our culture. And that the organic guys, not, nobody's perfect. Uh, lots of places I've worked on is challenges. I'm mean, not saying like we you wave the wand and oh my goodness it's fantastic. No, that's not true. But but by and large we're able to figure this thing out without using chemicals and without using poison. And and it requires a more creative approach. 
And a lot of farmers really like that. But until they get an opportunity to try that, they, they kind of look at that as skew and say, well, that's just real risky. A lot of people also think that this is still going on, that if you go organic, you've given up all your tools, you've got nothing to use. So oftentimes they go, oh, no way, but that's not true. There's a lot of things we can use. You may not use them, but you're not going to be stuck. You're not going to be hung out to dry. And that, a lot of times that scares people if they think they're going to get in and do something and then just have to let nature take its course. And way. I think that's something that really has, I mean, I mean, far more so now than there was 25 years ago um, you know, when you and I first met. I think there are a lot more options organically for if you do, if you are in a position where you need to react to something, where you weren't able to be proactive, uh, where something catches you off guard, where you, you actually do have the, the sort of input substitution products where you can might not be cheap, but you can, you know, you can stick it to the problem that you've got and a lot of times and get out of it now. Agreed. And I think the challenge, that's a good thing. And we do have a lot more choices than we did 25 or 30 years ago or whatever. But, uh, and, and the challenge there is not to get stuck in that input substitution approach to actually get to the whole systems approach, which is what I try to do. I, you know, I do sometimes we got rescue things we got to do. We got a problem. But, well, okay, what was the cause of that problem? You know, how did we get there so we get to the point where we stabilize the system, we don't need those things, but at least, especially in people in transition, they can, they can get through that stuck spot where the ecology is still kind of out of whack and use something that's acceptable organically and not as disruptive, and the system stabilizes some more. So, yeah, we're, we're fortunate now that there are more products out there. And not to say the products are a solution to anything, but they at least give you a set of tools so you feel empowered. Uh, at least that's how I see it. And so I do that. I use them. I suggest them to people when we feel like there's a need. But I want to do the, all the preventative stuff I can first and then also realize that that's just a symptom, something out of whack. Okay, that didn't stop working. What else do we have to do here to deal with the insect or the fungus or the weeds or the fertility that won't get us so we have to react. But that takes a while. And you just kind of react or you act in a way that you hope is going to be proactive. And then sometimes that system doesn't exactly work and you have to react. So I'm, I'm curious, you now, I mean, California, there's a reason that California grows most of the country's vegetables, but out here, a lot of the large organic growers, um, and of course, when we say large organic growers in the upper Midwest, we're, we're talking, you know, in the neighborhood of a hundred acres, we're not talking in the neighborhood of, of a thousands of, of acres when you're talking vegetables. Um, they really, a lot of them have gone to us, to a system to meet the, the cosmetic demands of the marketplace where they are more or less spraying on a schedule. There, there's, you know, there's a lot of, it's a very high input uh, way of farming. And I'm, yeah. I'm curious what sorts of things, cause I know you've been an advocate of, of quality and organic produce of, and of, of not just, not just quality in the sense of, you know, being full of nutrients or being full of antioxidants, but, but also in terms of being presented to the customer in the form that they expect it to be presented in. How, how, how do farmers, how do you recommend that farmers deal with that? Because I mean, obviously, I mean, I can do all the prevention I want, but at the same time, one, one caterpillar in a head of broccoli, um, you know, that's, I'm going to get my whole pallet load rejected. Uh, exactly. You know, and I, and we're at that stage now. I mean, you know, my, yeah, people are holding the standards of organic up as higher, higher than conventional produce, which is a little bit naive, you know, and so a lot of product doesn't end up on the shelf because it isn't perfect, which is always cosmetically perfect. We've got a society that's completely driven by what things look like, or almost completely, which is unfortunate. You know, if, if, if they could see the microorganisms crawling on their food, they wouldn't eat anything, but but they don't. So they're looking for the creepy crawlies. And so you do sometimes have to come in with these rescue materials. I, I do my best, not to say we always succeed, but my best to avoid the calendar spraying and end up with a, how much can you integrate the system, you know, so 
that's more habitat. There's more nutrition, push the nutrition up. So a real common problem that even or not just conventional, but organic growers too, is they get their fertility out of whack. You know, there's you get those big yields. All the stuff's been bred for high nitrogen. That's all the breed. Even the all the organic seeds are bred in pretty high nitrogen conditions. So we're you know we're looking for you know, how do we avoid getting things out of balance with too much N and N. While it's fantastic for yields, it does it just messes with you on diseases and insects and keeping quality and stuff. So I you know I'm constantly harping. I'm just actually doing some. Like consulting on the e- emails earlier today, going, look, we got to get more trace minerals in this. We got to get the soil biology working more and less reliant on bringing in fertilizer from the outside. So you got to get the soil ecology in better shape. But people still aren't that great at managing the humus fraction. We still don't get the full, full benefit from biology. And yet, and the nutrient range. So I, you know, I spent a lot of time doing nutrient testing, trying to okay, what's out of balance here, so that we can avoid an outbreak. But yeah, sometimes you know we've got all the things we can. We've got the habitat, the beneficial insects are out there, and still the bugs go faster than we can keep up with them. And the good news usually is we've got something we can come back and at least slow them down a bit. But yeah, I, I, I do my I do my utmost to keep farmers from calendar spraying. It just with the, with some with some rare exceptions, you know, like for example, uh, you know, controlling mildew and crops. This is a really hard thing to do, but plus the climate's really in your favor. So that might be a little more calendar oriented, but everything else pretty much we do is is only as needed. And that, and that I think that that's yeah, I think that's what you have to do. And, and it's growing a healthy crop. I still come back to in my experience. The plants that are grown really well and they're healthy, you don't get stressed, don't get over fertilized, don't get water, heat stress. Those are the ones you have the least problems with. And and have the best productivity and the best quality. So I work a lot with people on trying to minimize that disruption, keep the plants healthy. Amigo, we're gonna pause here and get a word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Osborne Seed Company. Osborne Seed Company is focused on serving professional growers on any scale, from market gardens to commercial scale, organic and conventional growers. With their active sourcing and trialing program, Osborne Seed is able to offer a wide range of products, giving growers a competitive edge with niche products, as well as a greater selection of varieties to meet the challenging and increasingly variable growing and marketing conditions faced by today's growers. I learned about Osborne Seed from one of the fussiest growers I know who recommended them to me as a source of high quality seeds. One of the little telling details about Osborne's dedication to quality and their focus on market farmers is that they pack all of their seeds to order in resealable form oil packets, which helps to maintain the quality of the seeds over time. When you grow crops for market and successions throughout the season, you need quality seeds the first time you plant them and the last. And little details like this make a huge difference. Osborne Seed Company, high quality seed and superior customer service. New and existing customers get $5 off the first order of $50 or more when you mention the Farmer to Farmer podcast. OsborneSeed.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Fertrell, a friend of nature since 1946. Fertrell has a full service agronomy department that provides support to their nationwide network of customers, dealers, and distributors. And Fertrell is about far more than just any one type of crop. They work with commodity and forage crops, large scale vegetable and fruit farms, and small scale and backyard growers, as well as livestock producers. No matter your level of experience, Fertrell has the products and the knowledge to help you grow healthy, natural plants and animals. Their full line of soil amendments, dry blend and liquid fertilizers, and weed, pest, and disease control products for organic production means that they can help you to assemble a comprehensive system for organic farming. The Fertrell Company knows that healthy soils are the foundation for healthy crops, not just from a philosophical standpoint or for maximizing nutrition, but also because building healthy soils sets the stage for harvest efficiency, post-harvest quality, pest resistance, and succession planting. Fertrell, better naturally. Fertrell.com. Now, one of the things that you guys are facing out there in, in California right now is this, and you mentioned it earlier, the four year drought. Um, and it's, it, it seems to be out of the news this week, but a couple of weeks ago, everybody was, was really, uh, really worrying about it. It was burning up the Facebook pages. Um, what are, how, how is that affecting your, your clients out there? 
Well, yeah, it really depends on where they're located. Um, it, it, the, I think the reason it made the news finally is that the government finally stepped up and said, we've got to do something about this because most people have been in denial. So the other piece of that is that water goes to the highest bidder in this state, probably everywhere else. So, you know, the urban users in California, although they use proportionately less water than grazers and farmers do, use a huge amount, and there's a tremendous amount of waste going on in urban areas, but because they're willing to pay, maybe willing is the wrong word, but because they're paying much higher rates than farmers do, water ends up getting transferred to those urban Southern California areas. So if you're, like this year, if you're a, you're a part of a district where water is, is uh, competed for economically, uh, people are losing out. They're not getting that water. Some growers, you know, uh, it's probably the most dramatic problems are in crops that are perennial crops, and fruits and nuts. Because in an annual crop, you can give the ground a fallow for a year or two. You know, you're going to lose some money, but you're not going to lose your whole field or lose some income, rather. Uh, now the perennial crops, the water is going for ridiculous prices in some of the districts, you know, because growers are realizing if they don't spend really high money for water now, they're going to have a dead orchard, and it's going to cost a lot more money to bring it back. That's one phenomenon. The prices of water spot prices going way up. That thing is just drilling rigs going everywhere wherever there's groundwater. Which that's a short term fix. We all know that, but people scramble that big straw goes into that aquifer, and you know we know these aquifers are going down pretty rapidly, but there's still water in them. Uh, you know, our district I'm in a zone or you know no pack has been the source of not only our water but export to other parts of the state. There's no snow pack this year, so now our district's on a 40 percent reduction. Guess what? The water that they don't use here gets sold downstream for about 15 times higher price than we pay for it. So, you know, it, it really varies. So, I mean, people will just, you know, I mean, I don't know if they're quitting farming, but they're quitting fields. Uh, or, you know, they're, I mean, it, now the other thing here is actually some of the fields that have higher organic matter content in them are having less problems because they have better water holding capacity. And those that, that's where this long term soil management is paying off. Are you finding that in in uh, both in annual crops and in perennial crops, where if they've got that higher organic matter, that they're they're doing better, they're more resilient in the even in this kind of an extreme drought. Um, I think I've noticed it more in the perennials actually. Uh, the annual crops, they all when they have access to water, they use it liberally. Uh, or if they don't have enough access to water for everything, they just cut back on the amount of acres. I can't say that I've seen a dramatic change in water usage in those crops, but in perennials, yeah. Perennials, okay. people, are, people are able to... Now, it doesn't mean the plants are thriving like when they're giving them a high-water diet, but they're at least surviving and growing, and that's in part at least because the soil holds more water between irrigations. And, and again, that... That's where this this long term perspective really pays off. Is that is that something that when you're working with a client when they're first starting to get into organic agriculture that that you're talking about? You know, hey, we we, I mean, obviously now this is something that's going to be on anybody's mind that you go and talk to next week. But when you when you were approaching clients ten years ago, were you saying, you know, hey, if we need to be thinking about creating resilience for everything for droughts, for floods, for, for whatever yeah. comes along. Uh, you know, I have to say I wasn't, you know, I, I think those become more obvious when things become crisis. You know, I mean, heat, heat wasn't as much of an, I mean, sort of sporadically, but now we're getting, you know, progressively warmer summers. These things seem to be more, uh, right. Or more important than they were perhaps when we had plenty of water and cool summers are cool. I have to also say, let's see, what's that old song? If you don't miss your water till your well runs dry, there, there is something to that. I mean, a lot of people are still in denial. As long as the well's pumping, everything's okie dokes. So, you know, I, I go out of my way to go, you know, actually, we might be in a 10 year drought. You know, four years is, is on a scale of things, isn't that long of a drought. So, Okay, so now I think it's a little bit more it's easier to get their attention about things like, you know, dust mulch or mulching or drip irrigation or microsprinklers or 
you know, uh, things that minimize water use, uh, and as well as better monitoring. A lot of people don't even monitor how much water they put on. They just say, I only need four hours, and then they go by, and then nobody's checking the dirt to see if it's got more than it needed. That, that's changing. I think that's, that's part of the upside of this. We're starting to pay a little more attention. But yeah, we talk about it more, a lot more than we did 10 years ago, I'll say that. You mentioned the monitoring and, and specifically in relationship to irrigation, but it's something I I feel like when I'm working with growers uh, that I feel is oftentimes missing is that people aren't, they're not taking that deliberate, that deliberate time to, to go out and pay attention to what's happening in their fields, whether it's, whether it's checking to make sure that the moisture is going deep enough or that they're not putting too much water on or whether it's scouting for pests before there's a problem or whether it's, um, you know, making sure that they understand what's happening on the weeds on that, on that field of vegetables that they've got two miles down the road. Um, Have you, is that something that you work with your growers on? Yeah, we talk about that a lot. I mean, I typically on a field start the monitoring and then I try to get the grower to take it over or one of their employees because I'm not there that often. And, you know, I don't want to be there that often. I actually want, I want to empower people to do this themselves. You know, it's, it gets sort of, again, it's, uh, to, to a degree, it's similar to this phenomena with the conventional farmers as you kind of give it up on somebody else's expertise. I actually prefer to, my best clients are the ones that push me. They're seeing stuff. They ask stuff. They ask questions. They're not the people in the field. I think I'm my strawberry clients. They're phenomenal growers. They really, they, they blow my mind because they really pay attention. You know, and it's the best of them are, are, I can't see what they're seeing. You know, and I'm like, really? And, you know, they make adjustments that, are, to my eye, are apparent. And that's, of course, they spend... And I, I say that because the strawberry growers spend an inordinate amount of time in their fields, and they, and as a result, they get much better yields and quality. I mean, we've done the time I've worked in in uh, organics and strawberries, we more than double the, the average yield without really doing much more than getting better at farming. You know, maybe a few varieties improve things a bit, but the majority of it's been better farming skills. So yeah, when you find people who pay good attention, those are the ones who seem to get the top yields. And a lot of people are well, either they're real busy, they're stretched real thin, uh, or they don't find that that there's that much um, direct reward on that paying a little closer attention. And those tend to be the middle of the road growers, and in organic, and you've been able to get away a bit with the middle of the road because you get a premium. In conventional growers, again, we're going to guys to learn a lot because they. They don't have that premium. They don't have that cushion. So they'd be had to get themselves good farming skills before they ever want organic because they're out of business. But yeah, it's a real range. I think there's a lot of people don't pay enough attention. I mean, you know, I'm shocked how often I find people have never even have done a nutrient test on their, like a perennial crop or an annual crop to find out what the heck's going on. They might have done a soil test, they typically can't read one. I don't know what the numbers mean. They want me to tell them what the numbers mean. Uh, I, you know, so I do. I wrote a book to help people understand what the their numbers mean, so they're not just buffaloed by somebody selling them fertilizer, organic or not. But yeah, considering how critical these things of monitoring and, and uh, management are, I'm often surprised how little that actually trickles down into the average farmer's uh, process. Do you have any suggestions for farmers about, I mean, you mentioned these being so busy, you know, you're spread thin and, but needing to, needing to engage in these processes. How do you, how do you help your clients actually get more, more engaged in, in, in monitoring when they're already pushed to the max? It's difficult. It really varies with the farm. Some of them, that's no way that's going to Just, there's, there's just no, they don't have the economics to make that work. You know, what I do is, you know, I, I walk fields and I, I, I would say I consist, but I really try to get the grower to walk them with me. So, well, it's just twofold. One is more eyes see more things, but also then they're feeling like they can make some of those decisions that I might be called upon on their own. So I think that's the best thing I can do is get them out in the field and, and walking and talking and, and, and looking and, and observing. And I, not every grower can I get them to do that. You know, it just really varies with the, 
with the personality and the press they're in, the, the push they're in, or rather. Uh, and I don't, I don't have an easy answer for that one. That's more like some individuals, my best clients to me are the ones that are paid. They think outside the box. They don't, they don't necessarily take my advice without really challenging it. And we think, and then I walk out in the field and I realize, well, they, they miss these details. So I pour this out, look right here, look right here. Uh, I do it in a way, hopefully, I don't offend them, but you know, I, I want them to actually look closer. Because, you know, I'm on these farms maybe, you know, once a month or so. That's not nearly enough to actually be really effective at advising, you know, in a holistic way. But they're there around there every day. So, I, like, for example, I have a lot of luck training Hispanic workers that are employees, you know, uh, we set up a system on some farms where we actually, the farm workers get a bonus for actually finding problems. And, you know, that, that kind of thing, it goes a long way because that empowers the farm worker. Uh, often who are, are pretty much powerless, don't feel like they have much uh, sway in the company. But they're going to get a little extra premium and they're also encouraged to find stuff. So they start looking. So I think any farmer that has employees, they have to, that's the place to work with them is to help encourage them through an incentive program to look more closely. And when they do that, they, everyone I've ever known that's done that is it's paid off much more than the cost of those incentives. But it's, I like tough that. Because it's a tough one. Yeah, that grape industry is where I learned that table grape industry. A lot of people in the strawberry industry too know. They pay. They basically pay these people to actually become their own eyes or become eyes for the farm. You know, and, and if you're in there working a field all every day or regularly, you you and you're and you're asked for your opinion. A lot of people will want to give it, and if you get a little bonus because you told something to the boss that was beneficial, well, then you're even more. I, I just think of one example. I I know a couple of farm workers who found a a grape variety is an anomaly on these three plants in the middle of a field there about 10 days ahead of everybody else. Never could 100% confirm why, but that became its own variety because it was 10 days earlier, and those guys each got a couple thousand bucks. Now, you can bet that everybody else on that company is out looking for something like that. That's right. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, and, and so... That, that whole company, they learned they have their way out of the game. They, the farm workers find find the problems way before the pest control advisors do, way before. And so, the, so that allows, especially with the organic system, if you can find something early before it goes fully awry, that has a huge payoff. So they pay these people extra, and you know, they're, that gets them engaged. And it, especially with Hispanic workers, they're, they're not. I wouldn't say they're always disrespectful, but they're not fully engaged. So this actually gets them involved, you know, and gets them to be part of the farm. And, and I don't see that happen very often, but the people that do that, you can really tell those farms, they really shine because they're really, they catch the details before things go wacky. And, and that, that, you know, and there, no farmer can get around and look at every corner of the field. So having the rest of the people at work for you be your eyes, it's a really good idea, and I just I haven't seen that spread very far. But it seems to me like a one of the ways that you can get a lot. Hispanic farm workers are amazing; they see a lot. They just are never asked. But yeah. once you start asking them, and then you, you know, these guys develop these nice little cards. You need enough writer speaks. To, I mean, writer reads Spanish. You just circle little pictures. So <laughs> even at the end of the field, and then the foreman or well, the owner or a farmer comes by and goes, well, let me go see what this guy saw. You know, and boom, now you're making a decision in real time. But that's an amazing tool. I'm still kind of surprised why it hasn't spread around more. I think it's great. I, I love that. I love that example of, of, uh, I spend a lot of my my energy focused on on management systems and and it's certainly something that has has really taken off in in manufacturing in recent years is trying harder to get the line people involved in providing feedback about how things are going and and noticing where the problems are noticing where there's opportunities for improvement. This just seems like a logical extension of that same idea. It's it's really great. I didn't realize they did that manufacturing, but it makes sense. I mean, you 
got the people right there dealing with all this stuff right in their face. They, oftentimes, they, if they don't see the solution, at least they recognize the problem. Well, you know, what is, what is, what does your therapist do when, when you go in and, and complain about what's going on in your life? The first thing she says is, is, well, what do you think we should do about it? Or what are you noticing about that? You know, it's, it's kind of that yeah. same idea that you want. I mean, the, the people that are, the people that actually have the expertise, I think are a lot of times the folks that are, that are on the ground, what they need is the tools. And, yeah. but, but they are the ones that are there noticing and in the best position to pay attention and, and really yeah. understand what's going on. So I agree. And if they're just encouraged, they, they most of them want to do that. I mean, they, I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, if you're out picking strawberries all day, it's kind of a boring job, but you know, if you're out there picking strawberries and you're also got an incentive to look for what else is going on, it becomes you're engaged. And once you're engaged, there's a lot more possibilities. But yeah, I, I think that's an area that our culture just isn't yet fully and get fully taken advantage of. I think that's a whole field. I'm trying to teach my apprentices how to become better observers. And, but, you know, it's still, that's the, they're young and they're still learning. But, you know, somebody's out there working as a field worker for years and years, and they, they see a lot. They just aren't ever asked for what they see. So when they are, there's a benefit. I think that's a nice segue into some of the work that you're doing now with the, the Felix Gillet Institute. Uh, the, doing the the conservation of the fruit varieties because that was that was something that you came to by being out on a being out in the in the natural world and observing what was going on with a with a fruit tree out there right yeah in nineteen seventy I was living up here and I just you know as was the case you want to know where all these roads go in the forest why don't we just go out there and we're just one day driving down a road and. September and about 12 miles into the forest, come out on a roll on a ridge and wow, there's wow, there's a bunch of fruit trees out here. What the heck is this? And that literally that first experience where we got out, the fruit was amazing. There was nobody out there. It was an old man in homestead that had been next to a mine, and uh, you know, and that's ever since I've been like, well, man, these are plants that that was 1970, and those plants at that point were about 90 years old. And, uh, you know, they, they were thriving with no care. And they see they had been taken care of when they were young, but they went feral and people had left. And I mean, certainly some of them had died, but a lot of them were just doing fine. Thank you. With no pruning, no spraying, no watering, no thinning, no fertilizing. And they only get harvested by the bears, which was, it still is one of our biggest challenges. So, uh, you know, we, so that was like, wow, that's interesting. And then the fruit was so, it was just phenomenal. You know, things I'd never tasted before. And that got me started on a hobby that's now grown into a project. But, you know, all around, I live in the Sierras of California where the gold rush literally, I live on the richest gold mining ridge or, or, or area in the world. There's a whole bunch of mines here back in the, Little ones, big ones. Every place somebody put a mine in, somebody put in trees to feed the miners, and or they had a ranch or a homestead or a farm, and you know. They, so we had all kinds of these plants over here when there were tens of thousands of people around here digging around for gold. And they also had to feed themselves. Turned out actually, oftentimes you can make more money selling stuff to the miners than the miners can make mining. So a lot of people planted things around here, and then you know. A fair number of them have survived, and that's what we've been uncovering now. I, I was in a hobby for 30 years, and then the last 15 years, I've been a little bit more uh, in, you know, involved in it. In the last 10 years, I really spent a lot more time. The last five years, we really amped it up, just like, all right, now this is important. We're starting to find some really good stuff, and then we take the best of those varieties and uh, propagate them and put them back out for gardeners and farmers. A lot of these are uh, extinct is a strong word, but there's very few of them left, let's say it that way. And so we, we find things, you know, and go, wow, this is a really great apple or pear or cherry or walnut or fig or grape. And, well, I don't see any commercial production, so let's see if we can get it back into people that grow and eat them. And that turned out to be a very exciting project. I, it's a ninth a uh, non-profit or business that I've started in my life, and this is the most exciting one I've ever done. It takes a long time to uncover this, so be patient, but 
it's potentially really large, and that, that's what's driving us in this thing. It's, it's still hasn't figured out how to be an economic project, but it, it's uh, got all the other makings of being something that's really important. At least it's important to me, and now other people are starting to get interested, which is why the thing is expanding. Can you tell me a little bit more about the about the preservation process that you're going through with the fruits and, and the efforts that you're making to get those out back into, into commerce? Yeah. So we know we've been, uh, we created a database years ago and we keep finding where you know, people call us up and tell us about, or we just, you know, one thing or another. Now we're up to about a little over 600 locations in four counties here in the Sierra. And we just, I think we've just kind of just scratched the surface, honestly, where, you know, there's a tree here, a tree there, a little orchard, size of a big orchard. Uh, we haven't been to all those to examine or extensively, but we get around as many of them as we can. And, uh, we get to those, we pick them at the right time. Like right now, first time ever, I picked cherries the day before yesterday. I never had some this early, uh, off a tree that's about 120 years old. And, you know, so you, so you, you find these things and then you try to figure out you know, the health of them, the age of them to, to this bit of old, but you get a rough estimate of the age. And then you pick fruit or the nuts or the grapes and then you, Evaluate them. Well, this one's really yummy, or this one has great shelf life, or this one's, you know, got no disease, or we use all kinds of methodology now to evaluate them. We've got a whole criteria that allows us to say, well, this, this plant's got something special. And then, if we can, we try to identify it, that is, by what it was originally called. This is really challenging. A lot of this stuff is just in line drawings or watercolors back from the 1800s, but. My sweetheart does a, does a tremendous job. She's, just, she's really focused on trying to figure out what these are. Sometimes we don't. We just name them after a little cow or something. But but we don't pick the best ones. I mean, we found hundreds and hundreds of varieties now. But you know, the ones that are special, the ones that make really good juice or really good sauce or you know, exceptional nut quality or they keep really well. Uh, those are the things we're looking for, or they don't get insects, or they don't get disease. You know, a lot of people spray a whole lot of things to control disease and insects. Well, we found a lot of varieties that aren't at all bothered by those pests. We have a big year right now around us with fire blight, which is a major disease in pears and apples. But we find varieties that definitely are susceptible to it. Then we find other ones just like they don't even know it. Another thing that we've been focused on is the drought hardiness. This is the fourth year of the drought. We got many of these trees we looked at. I haven't been that many yet this year. Maybe like a couple hundred so far. Maybe a few more now just since bloom. But uh, the vast majority of them have huge crops and they're making tons of new growth. Like they don't even know there's a drought. And, you know, that what that tells me is these plants have adapted. Even though we're having a major drought, they've been through this before. And they figure out how to survive. And I, I'm kind of blown away by how some of them, how big the crops are. We had a really mild spring, so there's a drought, so things set really heavy crops. And yet we're still making new growth. So so we take that, we evaluate that. We say, look, it's a tree that's got good hardiness, got good fruit or nut qualities. Uh, and then the best of those we put into our nursery and grow them out for, uh, for others to plant on their gardens or farms. And then we also take the best of those and put those into what we call a mother block, which is essentially, these trees are scattered all over the place, these mother, terrific grandmother trees. So we're trying to bring them into a spot where they're, you know, in one locale for a number of reasons, partly because things die out there in the wild, and partly because we can, quote unquote, take care of them here. And that's the project that we just started the last couple of years. It's fun. It's complicated, but we're learning how to do that. And, you know, we, I, I, uh, and we found us a ton of history in this stuff. And that, that, that's fun. And now we're just in the process of leasing a larger orchard. We're going to start producing some value-added products to kind of get people more interested in these heirlooms. Uh, some of them aren't the most beautiful, but the flavor is outrageous. You turn them into something, nobody's going to notice their lack of beauty. So, uh, or size, or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, we have a multifaceted project that, is, to me, is the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. And is the is the institute uh, woven in with with your heaven and earth farm, or is that something that's completely separate? 
Well, it's it's headquartered on the farm. It has its own nonprofit status. We use it as part of the farm for growing the trees. We also have a couple other locales we use that we lease. Uh, and the, the the tree, the old trees themselves, uh, I have a couple of them on this property, but the vast majority of them are other locales. So it's kind of integrated together. Heaven Earth Farm operates on its own, but it leases a piece of its land to the Felix Project for the trees. And I, uh, and and tell me a little bit about about Heaven and Earth Farm because you've. It's my understanding that you farmed in several different locations in California. You, it's not like you just got onto one place in 1970 and just and spent 40 years developing that. You've been. You've been in a variety of locations. You've done a variety of different kinds of farming. What are you What are you doing now in terms of, of production? Well, that's true, Chris. I, I never had any money, so I wasn't able to buy a piece of land. You know, so I leased things, and then over that time, we leased a lot of different properties and tried different crops, learning about them from annuals to perennials. And this farm, uh, we've been in an olive business for a number of years, making olives and olive oil in the 90s and early 2000s. And we found that was a, a business that was, wasn't sustainable in a lot of ways, but it also was reliant on marketing things at a pretty high price to make them pay. And then we had to, mar- we had to go a long ways to market them. We're, we're a long ways from any urban areas. And, we decided that that wasn't a very sustainable model. So when we bought this place in 2000, which is as my now ex sweetheart, uh, got a little inheritance from her aunt, said, Oh, we can actually put down some money on a piece of land. So we bought this farm, and our goal right off the bat was we want to sell everything in the neighborhood or maximum in our two local towns, which are 15 miles away. And we want to diversify into a lot of different kinds of crops and not a lot of any one thing. So we've got about, I think, almost 60 different varieties of perennials. And, you know, it's something kind of fruit and nut we could think of that grow around here. And we keep planting more of those. There's, as, as was our case, when we were leasing land, you really can't put perennials in or it's, or it's risky. So we are always farming annuals. So as we bought this place thing, oh, let's just put our time and mostly our efforts into perennial crops, which, you know, we still have our annuals to sell, of course, but, but the, uh, uh, the perennials are the mainstay of the project, and, and that's related to the Felix, because those are all perennials, too. And so we, we planted a number of these heirloom ones on the property, plus other modern ones, kind of a mixture of them both. So our little farm focuses on high quality, predominantly perennials that we sell right in the neighborhood or into town where there's restaurants and a couple stores. Uh, and we don't do any long distance sales anymore, like we used to in the all business. And you know, it, it, as a tourist, we live in a, we farm in an area which climatically is challenging. Uh, this year's been great, but you know, a lot of years we get a lot of frost or grain and. It, it makes for an interesting thing, but it also, by having that diversity, we're able to kind of weather out through the bad weather and some things bloom later or earlier and miss the, the severe weather. This year, everything's doing great because we haven't had any weather, but, but you know, having a mix. So I, we're kind of focused on, and the other piece of this is to teach young people how to farm or at least get them involved enough that they want to farm. So I've taken on, well, even before I started this farm, I've taken on apprentices for decades. And, you know, try to get them encouraged into doing agriculture and to get them to learn a little bit about a lot of different kinds of crops. And, and that, that's kind of my goal. So we, we do minimal amount of uh, uh, equipment. We try to do a lot of this by hand. So people get close to it. We do use the equipment, of course, but not, as, not much. And, you know, we don't even get these people and kids, you know, so we do things like we do homesteading skills. We make our own everything, all the different processed foods, dried and canned and frozen and juiced and fermented and all those things. And and that's another skill that they are, group of skills they get in addition to learning how to grow crops. So we're kind of a hybrid between a homestead and a production farm, and we're focused heavily on the education component. At the end of our shows, Amigo, I always like to ask everybody that comes on three questions, uh, you know, kind of our... Uh, um, Oh, there's a, the lightning round, if you will. Uh, so what's, what's your favorite tool on the farm? And I'm thinking that with your history of Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, you've got, 
I mean, you must know just about every tool that's out there. Uh, so I'm really interested to know what's, what's your favorite? Well, I think my favorite tool right now is one I'm still in the process of inventing. Uh, you must have heard the, about the weed blaster techniques that have people been working on in the Midwest. I, I've been developing my own version of a weed blaster. And I can't say that I've got it. Maybe favorite's a strong, a strong word. It's, it's one that's intriguing to me. Uh, and it, I, I see the potential with this with this using air pressure and grit to actually uh, greatly change the way we do weed control. So I've been doing a lot of experiments with that. I, I like that. I'm still refining it. It's not I haven't quite settled on the final design, but I'm impressed by that. What else do I really like? I really like that filter that, that Elliot invented. I use that a lot for prepping beds. That's a great little tool. Yeah, if you can keep the battery charged on your drill, that's the real trick with that one. Yeah, exactly. Actually, the other one I'm really into is I've been I've been importing different uh, pieces of equipment, uh, hand tools. And I'm really fascinated by some of the pruners and, and saws I'm getting from Italy, or, and shears and, and loppers and stuff. Those are, that's really fun stuff because I'm, I'm actually. <sighs> I mean, part of why I started Peaceful Valley was to give people access to things that were hard to find. But finding out that even even this late to date, there's a lot of things being made around the world that Americans don't see. So I was starting to import things mostly for our own farm. We're going to sell a few of those this year through Felix Soleil. But you know, I'm fascinated by things that you know are better better adaptations on what we normally think is the, you know the highest quality stuff. So. That, been, been doing the last couple of years working, trying out different brands of European uh, uh, pruning, and, and uh, that's actually we use a lot of that stuff in our Felix project. So you know, when you find something that's really a big improvement, you know, like you can tell. So I, that I like those. I have to say that it might be my single group of tool, tools I'm most impressed with are these Italian-made pruners and loppers and saws. They're phenomenal. It is something I, I did some some work with fruit when I was out in Maine in the late nineties and, and it it really is something else to go from a, a mediocre pruning saw to something that really does work. I mean it's just it's it's kinda like I and I don't know about mind blowing, but it's 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 a revelation. You go, Oh yeah, this is what this is supposed to be like. Exactly. And although I've always thought I had pretty good tools the last couple of years, like, oh, oh, this is a whole other level. Which you know is intriguing and exciting. So yeah, that's that's probably my favorite set of tools at the moment. And then and then and I I love asking this question of of people out in California because you guys can grow just about anything out there. But what is your favorite thing to grow? If you had to if you had to just pick one, what would it be? I think it'd be cherries. Actually, I really love cherries. There's a lot of varieties we've been finding in this Chile project. Um, I think almost everyone loves cherries. I mean, it's a rare person who doesn't get excited when you have a basket of cherries. And there's something about that that I harkens back to when I was a kid. You know, and he just, I don't know, there's a memory here that my, my great aunt and uncle grew cherries. Maybe that's why it's in my genetic code. But there's something about a ripe cherry that just, and it maybe because it's one of the first fruits of the season. I think if I was going to pick one thing to grow, I do grow probably cherries. And and so I'm I'm kind of curious. I mean, I grew up in Seattle. We we ate a lot of cherries there, but they were all they were all pretty much the same. They were good. They were a very memorable experience. But what's what's different in the in the cherries that you're getting in the in the Felix Gillet project? Well, they really vary. You know, you know, the focus on the last fifty years in our culture has been, you know, basically size and crunchiness with cherries. But where does it there's a huge range of flavor profiles? It's hard to describe those, but uh, these we're finding cherries, you know, that were typically in the past you know, uh, might have been used for making a a liqueur or, or making a jam or a juice, or necessarily for fresh eating. Although well, certainly good for that. And there's just a yeah, it's tremendous. Oh, we do these fruit tastings as part of a project in you know, small amounts of the public, and they get blown away by how different some of these things taste from what you perceive. You know, cherries are hot, cherries are cherry. No, actually, they aren't. And 
Yeah, it's hard to describe that. I can't describe flavor, but there's just some really incredible succulents that comes in some of these varieties, which, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe the biggest fruit or the bright, shiniest, so they kind of fall by the wayside, but the flavors are what catches my attention. Yeah, and I can imagine that just based on, you know, think about what's happened with apples in the last 20 years, um, you know, going from Red Delicious to, to now all of the different varieties you can get in just about any grocery store. It's, yeah. I guess, if you kind of take that and apply it to cherries, that would make sense that you would have the same yeah. kinds of diversity of experience there. Somehow, I mean, if I was asking to pick one, cherries, somehow they just stand out. Maybe it's because I just picked cherries and it just kind of stuck with me, but. Boy, I have to get some of these. I just go, my God, what an amazing flavor. You know, we you know, struggle to figure out what they are. They're kind of one of the harder fruits to actually identify, but it's sort of like, sort of like variety. But Jalea had almost 50 varieties in his catalogs over the years. So you start finding these things. Well, why did they have 50 varieties back then? Well, it had a lot of different uses, you know. And it wasn't, you know, now we're down to, I don't know, five or six kinds of cherries are kind of the whole market. So, right. Yeah, I have. I was picking one of the pictures. And then, and then, last question for you: If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? <laughs> it's a good question, Chris. Well, I think well, I would tell myself that this, this is a long process. That, that I wasn't going to ever figure out uh, much in the first year or second year. I mean, look, and if I had a long range vision, I, I, I've got the ability to get metric by some older gentleman, especially Carlton Rouse, who was when I met him in the 70s, he was in his 80s. And you know, CEO was very wise and farmed organically before it was called organic and then went into the conventional world. And But we'd always ask him, so, you know, it's my friend's grandpa, so we'd call him grandpa. So, well, what was it like when you're farming in the 30s? And, you know, twenties, and then so we kind of like get this whole perspective of what used to be "quote unquote" like, and realize that here he was in his eighties, and he was still working. He was still modifying his system, and I think it I, that didn't really stick with me right. I didn't quite get it that it isn't a agriculture isn't a fixed thing. It's an evolutionary thing. It's a dynamic thing. I think that's what I would have told myself was you know. Hold on, you've got a whole life ahead of you here. You're just starting scratching the surface. And the more you look, the more you see, the more you see, the more you want to know more. And it, it, it just doesn't be a, reveal itself very fast. It takes a while, and it, it takes you a time to actually get into the ability to see, even see, ask the question. Uh, that's what I said to myself is be patient, and you're going to keep learning. I love it. I love it. Amigo, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks so much for asking, Chris. I'm really honored. If people want to learn more about the Felix Gillet Institute, where where would they go to do that? Yeah, we have a web page. Uh, it's Felix, F-E-L-I-X, Gillet, G-I-L-L-E-T, FelixGillet.org. That's the okay. Amigo, thank you again so much. It's it's uh, really an honor to honor to do this interview with you and, and your generous sharing of your time and your expertise with us. This has been fantastic. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. I uh, look forward to talking to you again. So wrapping things up here, you can find links from this show and more at farmer to farmer podcast.com. Just search for Contisano, C-A-N-T-I-S-A-N-O, or maybe it would be easier to search for Amigo, A-M-I-G-O. Uh, that's that's the easiest and best way to get to those show notes. If you're not already listening to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice, I'd really encourage you to subscribe, get those new episodes just as soon as they're released. And please take the time to leave a rating or review. It really does make a difference in how many people this show reaches. You can also leave comments for us on the show notes page of each episode. I'd love to know what you think. If you're liking what you hear, I encourage you to sign up for my newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga, at farmer to farmer podcast.com or at my other website for my consulting and education company, which is purplepitchfork.com. One more thing. If you've hung on this long, I'd love to know what questions you have that my guests or I might be able to answer in the podcast. Please let me know on Facebook at purple pitchfork or use the contact page on farmer to farmer podcast.com. Anything about farming and farm life is fair game. And if you want to be anonymous, just let me know. And I won't mention your name on air. If we choose your question to use on air, I'll even send you a farmer to farmer podcast mug. 
Ah, I should say, I'll even send you a collector's item, the Farmer to Farmer podcast mug. Okay, now, let's see. I know I know how to turn this thing off. 